it, it never gets old. Key to ask him to walk out. Oh, uh, okay. I have three minutes out right now. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour. My name is Jill Vardy, and I'll be moderating this press conference for the Bank of Canada. Governor Polaz and Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins will be pleased to take your questions for about 45 minutes. Governor Polaz is going to start with some opening remarks and then we'll go straight to your questions. Governor? Well, thank you, Jill. Uh, good morning, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins and I are glad to have the opportunity to answer your questions about today's monetary policy announcement and our MPR. Allow me to begin with just a few comments. The Canadian economy is experiencing significant and rapid contraction. The shock is a global one, affecting all countries, but com commodity producing countries like Canada are being hit twice. In the very near term, policymakers can do little more than to cushion the blow. 
It's worth spending a moment to emphasize why the central bank's inflation targets matter so much, even at a time such as this. Inflation targets were put in place around the world when the dominant worry was higher inflation. Today, the situation is very complex. However, Governing Council agreed that the balance of forces points to weaker demand and a decline in inflation as the dominant concern. Inflation targets provide an anchor for the economy, particularly inflation expectations, and a guide for policy actions equally in today's situation. Keeping inflation close to target means taking measures to ensure that the economy stabilizes and then returns to full capacity. Failing to do so now would mean that inflation would persistently fall short of target. If inflation were to fall short of target for an extended period, faith in that anchor would be eroded, and policymakers would face even greater challenges in returning the economy to full capacity. This challenge can become particularly acute should inflation fall persistently below zero. Sub-zero inflation, or deflation, would interact with existing indebtedness in a particularly undesirable way. Specifically, negative inflation would increase the real value of outstanding debts, while it would erode the ability of companies and households to service their debt, which is a very difficult mix for the financial system. Fortunately, the risk of sustained deflation in Canada is low for various reasons. Let me mention three. Premièrement, les gouvernements ont réagi à la pandémie en prenant des mesures vigoureuses et élastiques. Ces mesures vont étayer l'économie et préparer le terrain en vue de la reprise qui va suivre. C'est le cas surtout des subventions salariales qui sont conçues pour maintenir le lien entre le travailleur et son employeur, ce qui va renforcer la confiance et faciliter la reprise. Deuxièmement, quand la pandémie a commencé, l'économie canadienne fonctionnait près de son potentiel et l'inflation était autour de la cible de 2 Tout comme une personne en bonne santé a plus de chances de venir à bout d'une inf infection à la COVID-19, une économie en bonne santé a plus de chances de se remettre rapidement d'un choc négatif majeur. Troisièmement, le Canada est parvenu avec beaucoup de succès à maintenir l'inflation près de la cible pendant plus de 25 ans. Par conséquent, les investisseurs, les entreprises et les ménages s'attendent à ce que la banque agisse pour aider l'économie à revenir à sa pleine capacité et pour réaliser une inflation stable de 2 C'est exactement dans cette optique qu'il faut voir les mesures prises récemment par la Banque. In recent weeks, Governing Council lowered our policy interest rate three times to 0.25%, which we consider to be its effective lower bound. These moves were based on analysis of the factors that we could measure immediately, mainly the likely fallout on the economy from the collapse in oil prices, as well as the immediate effects of measures to contain the coronavirus. This preliminary analysis indicated that cutting rates all the way to the effective lower bound was the best contribution that the bank could make to stabilizing the economy and complementing the government's efforts. Looking ahead, the outlook is highly conditional on how long the containment measures remain in place and how households and firms adapt. Governing Council agreed that it would be false precision to offer its usual specific forecast. Instead, <clears throat> we chose to offer two plausible illustrative scenarios for the economy. One should be thought of as a best case, given where we find ourselves today, while the other is a much more severe scenario. Many possible outcomes lie between these scenarios but based on the bank's new analysis, Governing Council concluded that substantial monetary stimulus needed to be in place to lay the foundation for the post-containment economic recovery. 
For the bank's policy actions to reach companies and households and foster a robust recovery, it's crucial that financial markets function well. In the past few days, Governing Council's deliberations focused mainly on what additional actions the bank could take to achieve this goal. There has been some improvement in market functioning, but important strains continue. And Governing Council acknowledged that near-term borrowing requirements of governments and the private sector are likely to pose further challenges. We decided to increase the bank's participation in the government's Treasury bill auctions to 40% of each new issue, and to underscore that our program of purchasing at least $5 billion per week of Government of Canada bonds in the secondary market could be increased at any time, should market conditions warrant it. A similar argument applies to provincial government bond markets, which are seeing significant strains, hence our decision to supplement our program to buy provincial money market securities by also buying up to $50 billion in provincial bonds. Government, Governing Council also noted that the corporate bond market continues to show signs of stress, although our program to purchase commercial paper has helped. Governing Council reasoned that the bank's presence in the secondary corporate bond market would ease some of these strains and announced a $10 billion purchase program aimed at high quality corporate borrowers. In addition, Canada's major banks face relatively high longer term funding costs in the corporate bond market, a factor that is leading to upward pressure on some longer term mortgage rates, despite the 150 basis point drop in our policy rate. For this reason, Governing Council decided to lengthen the term of its weekly repo operations to allow for funding for up to 24 months. This should lead to improved funding conditions for the major banks and therefore help companies and households benefit more from monetary stimulus. Now the bank has so far accumulated over $200 billion of new assets. This amounts to about 10% of Canada's GDP in liquidity support for the economy. And the bank's balance sheet has expanded by about this amount as a consequence. This is natural at a time when financial market participants and firms seek to increase their levels of liquidity because it is the central bank's job to fulfill those needs. If we failed to do our job, increased liquidity demands could instead lead to a contraction of credit availability with obvious consequences for individuals and the economy. When financial tensions ease as the pandemic runs its course, these extra liquidity demands will dissipate and the bank's balance sheet expansion can reverse over time. The bank stands ready to augment the scale of any of its programs should market conditions warrant it. Governing Council agreed that the combination of aggressive fiscal action and monetary stimulus will create the best possible foundation for the recovery period. La banque se tient prête à augmenter l'ampleur de ses programmes si les conditions du marché le justifient. Le Conseil de direction a convenu que la combinaison des mesures budgétaires énergiques et de l'assouplissement monétaire va jeter les meilleures bases possibles pour la reprise. Before concluding, let me point out that this NPR is unique in one other respect. This is the 25th anniversary of the first NPR published under Governor Gordon Teeson's leadership in May 1995. We've marked this event by using the same front page as 25 years ago. Ironically, I was one of the architects of that very first NPR, and today's will be my last. I wish the circumstances were more favorable. With that, Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins and I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Governor. We're going to go to questions now. We're going to do one question per reporter in this first round because I already have quite a long list. Um, before asking your question, please state your name and affiliation. I just want to remind people to mute their line if they're not asking a question, and you can do that by pressing star six, and when you want to unmute, you press star seven. Avant de poser une question, voulez vous identifier. Libre à vous de poser vos questions dans la langue officielle de votre choix. Pour mettre votre ligne en mode discrétion, 
appuyé sur étoile 6 et fait étoile 7 pour l'enlever. Uh, for reporters who are late in joining the call, if you have a question, please let us know by sending an email to communications at bankofcanada.ca and I'll put you in the queue. Pour les journalistes qui sont joints à l'appel avec un peu de retard, envoyez un bref courriel à communication à bankofcanada.ca si uh, vous souhaitez poser une question et on jettera votre nom à la liste. Okay, uh, first of all, I'm going to go to David Parkinson from the Globe and Mail. Go ahead, please, David. Reminder, Dave, to unmute your line by pressing star seven. Dave, we'll come back to you. I'm going to go next to Heather Schofield from the Toronto Star. Please go ahead, Heather. It looks like we're having some temporary technical difficulties with the teleconference. We're just going to put the conference on hold and try and fix it and come back shortly. Please stand by. You are the only call in this conference. On there. Okay, Heather, we can hear you right, now. Looks... So it's uh, Heather, can you hear us? I can hear you, yes. Great, please go ahead and ask your question. Looks like we're back in business. Okay. Um... The, the website's not back. For those of you I, who. I'll go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, please, Heather. Uh, everyone okay. else, please mute your line. Okay. Um, so, good morning. Thank you for taking our questions. Um, it's Heather Schofield from the Toronto Star here. Um, I, you know, there have been, been a lot of economists who have um, talked about about the economic effects of, of um, letting off on the restrictions too soon, and I'm wondering how that fits um, in, into your um, projections and, and your scenarios. Um, you know, is there an economic um, reason that would compel people to come back soon, and, and what if it's too soon and they and they uh, you know the, the pandemic is not completely under control. Well, this is one of the reasons why we we aren't putting forward a real forecast uh, today, Heather. Um, I mean, it's just it's just impossible to make those kinds of judgments. Uh, the, the two scenarios that we put out give you a sense of the comparison. Uh, the the first one, uh, which I, I described in my remarks, is given where we are today, it's probably rough roughly what we could achieve as a best case scenario. And that would be, uh, you know, be a beginning of the lifting of uh, containment measures, you know, end of May, sometime, something like this, uh, May, late May or early June. And then you get the economy gradually picking up traction and get that, that the initial V shape of the, of the economy just as it re-engages, you get the V shape and then you get the more 
uh, gradual uh, re return to where we were before, give or take uh, uh, a few tenths. So uh, what happens then if you extend that out a couple more months is the V gets deeper and then of course it takes a little longer because you, you, you've, you've put some more dynamics in motion. Um, and those are meant just to illustrate uh, very highly judgmentally. There's no real math uh, around this. So I'm afraid that's not a real, real thorough answer to your question, but it's, uh, I hope it gives you some insight. That's how we would at least think about it. Um, the kind of trade-off you're asking is something that would be not for a central banker, but you know, for elected officials to, uh, to think about and, and, and take their guidance on. Okay, thank you. Um, just so journalists are, uh, have a heads up on when they're coming up in the queue, I'm gonna go next to Dave Parkinson from The Globe, then to David Lundgren from Reuters, Shelley Hagen from Bloomberg. Dave Parkinson, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yeah, you got me? Okay. Uh, just, just wanted to ask um, if, if uh, in your deliberations, if um, you know the decision not to um, issue detailed um, outlook figures. Um, was there any concern in your deliberations uh, expressed that that this might send um, a concerning signal to the markets or to the public that the, the central bank wasn't willing to, uh, to make forecasts at this time? Were you worried that there might be a, a negative interpretation of that? Uh, no, I, I, that, that didn't encounter, I didn't encounter that in our discussions. I mean, uh, we did deliberate it uh, because, of course, it has been a practice for us for a very long time. So, so I don't want you to think that we took it lightly, but we had a, we had a good, uh, a good uh, discussion around uh, did we have enough uh, material in front of us to be able to construct a forecast. We concluded that the answer, uh, the honest answer is no. Uh, so. Uh, last thing we want to do is offer some form of false precision. Uh, I've said in earlier uh, earlier press conferences that the bank doesn't think of itself as being in some sort of forecasting contest. Uh, when we construct a forecast, it's something that we then make policy decisions uh, based upon. So it's it's a tool of decision making, uh, as opposed to uh, you know putting numbers up that. Uh, you know, maybe maybe have very little actual uh, analytical content. So I can assure you that uh, just as much work as ever happens uh, happened uh, for these uh, for the, the scenarios that we're laying before you today, there is a very rich analysis of uh, of new data, short-term data, high-frequency data that help the staff to kind of frame up that discussion. So then, as policymakers, what we do is we take that for what it's worth and say, well, now we have to be thinking about what are the risks around that uh, narrative and how do we as policymakers manage around those risks. And as you can see, and as I just said in my, my remarks, that we concluded based on even that sort of uh, level of detail that we should move, we should have interest rates at the effect of lower bound. And furthermore, we should be backing that up with some of these other uh, uh, moves that are intended to ensure that that transmission mechanism is working well and in well in place when we begin uh, the recovery period. Thank you. Next hey, up, thank you. Next up is David Lundgren from Reuters. Please go ahead, David. Um, hi there. It's actually Kelsey Johnson with Reuters. Okay, Kelsey. Um, our, que our question is that. Uh, Governor, some analysts doubt that quantitative easing will be effective in Canada. Are you considering yield curve control by targeting purchases at a particular tenor, such as the five-year bonds? <clears throat> okay, well, uh, for, for the moment, uh, all of our operations have, have been aimed at market function. Uh, so uh, this is, of course, we've said this uh, before, uh, that we kind of drawing a bit of a distinction between the concept of LSAP, uh, large-scale asset purchases, versus QE. 
Uh, they look exactly the same when you do them for practical purposes. Uh, however, there is a distinction, which is what is the objective of the operation. Um, and the objective of LSAPs is to bring more order uh, to financial markets and ensure that they're functioning well. Uh, usually the objective for QE is framed around uh, an interest rate objective, that is a longer term interest rate than the one that we, that we actually set at the bank. And, um, and so yield curve control is just in that family of aiming at either specific points on the yield curve or the yield curve, you know, on average. Um, with, the, with the 10 year yield sitting at 0.75% uh, um, and the economy at the moment basically turned off, uh, there's very little, uh, there's very little purpose in conducting operations aimed at trying to lower longer term interest rates. And so we have not moved into that uh, space at this stage, that would be a decision that's more of a monetary policy decision that we would we would look at uh, later on when the recovery, um, is, we are in the recovery phase of this story. And at that time, we'd consider whether we needed to deploy uh, QE with the specific objective around a specific interest rate or as an area in the yield curve. So uh, those, those, uh, those deliberations can wait for another day because today, uh, we're dealing with an economy where monetary policy has very little by way of traction. What we're working on is to establish very solid conditions for the recovery period so that when the recovery does start, it'll have the, uh, the best momentum that we can give it. Thank you. I'm going to go to Shelley Hagen next. Following Shelley, uh, just to give people a heads up, I'm going to be turning to Kevin Gallagher, Raul Vidanoff, and Greg Quinn. Shelley, please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, Governor. Is the strain in credit markets better or worse than three weeks ago when you implemented the large scale asset purchase program? Okay, well, that's a great question. I'm going to turn that question over to uh, Ms. Wilkins. Uh, the, the short answer to that question is yes, it is better. Uh, three weeks ago, there was a lot of volatility in. Uh, in equity markets, uh, at the same time, we saw you know a lot of pre-positioning for quarter end and uh, and a lot of portfolio shifts, and and for that reason, there was a lot of a lot of tension. Uh, at the same time, the programs that we put in place, whether it's our term repos, our BA purchases, or other purchases, uh, served us well because they really helped unblock some of those markets, and we've seen a narrowing of spreads. Uh, as well as just more smooth activity. And, and the, the actions by other central banks have also helped uh, create that, that more positive dynamic. Uh, that being said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, pretend that the conditions in markets, particularly the, the term markets past one year, are, are particularly functioning well, better than they were. But, uh, but uh, if we think about our objective to have well-functioning markets, and uh, so that we set the stage for a good recovery and we allow firms and, and people to have access to credit, then the programs that we introduce today will contribute to that. Thank you. Okay, next up, Kevin Gallagher. Go ahead, Kevin. Hello, uh, Governor uh, Polos. Uh, today you decided against lowering the uh, target interest rate and instead targeted monetary stimulus. Uh, but what are the likely future and further mechanisms that the bank is most strongly considering to ease the stress on the economy? Well, um, look, we, look, I want to start with uh, we, we've known for some time now, and I measure that in years. That, uh, that monetary policy was not in a position to, uh, to deal with a, a large macro shock if it came along, that uh, almost all countries would, would need to be using fiscal policy, and that's exactly what has happened. So and uh, that's the most important consideration here is that monetary policy is playing a complementary supporting role uh, in making sure that uh, all the tools function at their maximum. So with uh, the interest rate at the effective lower bound, 
Uh, we were already at that, that, in that sense, maximum stimulus. Uh, we have some uh, additional tools, of course, that we've started using, mainly aimed at market function, as I've said earlier. But those tools, of course, can be augmented at any time. Uh, going back to the earlier question, uh, if, we, uh, if we feel that they're needed in order to buttress the uh, recovery phase, uh, we have, will have no hesitation in using them, uh, uh, augmenting those tools and, and using them more forcefully if we think they'll give us a stronger recovery. Um, personally, I think that the recovery is going to have a lot of pent-up characteristics to it. Uh, of course, this depends on uh, when it begins. Uh, but what, what matters to this is that uh, the fiscal actions that have been taken in particular put a floor under consumer and business confidence, effectively stopping the clock as opposed to seeing a, a cumulative negative dynamic. We just try to stop the clock and then restart the economy later. Uh, the recovery, is certainly in its initial phases, uh, is not going to feel like the typical recovery from a recession uh, because because people won't need to be talked into it they're 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 already talked into it so um, that's uh, I mean that's about all I've got uh, for on in relation to that question today we have other tools perhaps Ms. Wilkins likes to would like to just talk briefly about the other things in our toolkit uh, that uh, we we have there that's that's our our unconventional toolkit uh, but uh, we aren't we aren't discussing them actively today I would appreciate that if you could discuss those tools. Sure. So, so I would start with uh, the tool that we have not deployed, which is uh, funding for credit, which would be uh, providing fun funding to a financial institution who tied that funding to a loan to, say, a, a small and medium-sized enterprise. We haven't done that uh, because credit markets are largely open, and at the same time, there's also some, some new government programs that are aimed at doing exactly that. Uh, the other things that we have in our toolkit are, are using the tools that we've already deployed in different ways. And so, and so for quantitative easing as an example, uh, it's true that for a small open economy like Canada's, it's hard to influence yields very far out the curve, but, cert but the research shows uh, from other countries that, that, in fact, you can at shorter durations, say, three to five years. Um, with respect to credit easing, one of the things you observe in this kind of situation is that even though government yields might be falling, the yields on corporate debt aren't falling as much. And so what credit easing can do is, is help the transmission mechanism work better by working not only on the functioning of markets, but on the price that, that corporations need to pay. That's what full out credit easing is aimed for. Those are just a couple of examples of, of uh, either a tool that we haven't deployed or a augmented and different objective, different use of the tools that we've already deployed that would be aimed at the end of the day, and I need to stress this, at getting a sustained recovery that is consistent with our objective of targeting inflation. Thank you. Next up, Raul. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Oh, okay, great. Um, uh, good morning, uh, Governor and uh, Senior Deputy Governor. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I spoke to a couple of economists who said that the destruction of the supply side of the economy, it's not hard to see inflation coming in consumer goods given the amount of liquidity in the system and the money printing that, that had to take place. But your models indicate that that's not going to be the case. Um, would you tell consumers that uh, inflation in groceries or other typical goods they buy won't be a problem after the virus uh, crisis passes? Or is it that inflation could, could spike after uh, 2022? Or will it just appear in um, asset, asset prices like, like it did after the uh, financial crisis uh, 10 years ago? I mean, pretty big that, that had to take place. But your models indicate that that's not going to be the case. Um, would you tell consumers that uh, inflation in groceries or other typical goods they buy won't be a problem after the virus uh, crisis passes, or is it that inflation could, could spike after uh, 2022, or will it just appear in um, asset, asset prices like, like it did after the uh, financial crisis uh, 10 years ago? I mean, pretty big that had to 
Raul, we're getting some strange feedback, so can I ask you to mute your line, please? Thank you. Governor, please go ahead. Okay, well, um, yeah, well, this, this is, of course, the, the, t the toughest part of all uh, in this, uh, in this uh, environment to make a forecast around this, uh, precisely because the shock is affecting the supply side and the demand side of the economy at the same time. Uh, now, when, when, we're, when this is over, when we begin to put the economy uh, back, uh, back into gear, the supply side of the economy is, is going to react right away, but not all of it, not all at the same time. Uh, similarly, though, on the demand side, we won't get the reaction all at once either. Uh, we learned this from China, for example. So China, uh, we were just on the G20, uh, G20 meeting this morning, and China is reporting that most people are back to work, uh, so things are are, are running again. The supply side is, is uh, at least in the uh, industrial production, is, is right up there. Uh, but uh, people are going to work every day and coming home every day, but then not going out very much uh, on the weekend or, or evenings. And so you can see there, there's evidence there on that early sign that the, the, the demand side might be a little slower to pick up than the supply side. But that may just be for certain sectors, such as entertainment or restaurants or, of course, personal travel. So this is uh, almost impossible for us to, uh, to glean out. And so uh, what we've considered is those various possibilities. As I said in my opening remarks, that uh, Governing Council concluded from this that the, the, for, the net of all this, uh, the, the, the forces acting on the economy, our, our larger concern would be in the downside for inflation. That the demand is is the thing that could fall short of supply during that recovery phase, and how and hold inflation lower, uh, below target uh, for for a longer period, and so that's of course one of the reasons why we're orchestrating uh, all the stimulus that we we have on the table today, and making sure that we're making these other market moves so that it does find its way to the ultimate borrower. Um, so at this stage. Uh, I have to just admit to you that there are two sides to this, and of course people will observe certain prices perhaps going up because of short supplies. That's, that's inevitable because supply chains are heavily disrupted. Um, they will also see some imported prices will, will be a little higher than they're used to well, because the Canadian dollar is lower than it was just a few months ago. Not a lot, but it is a little bit lower. And so those things will affect prices. I think uh, Another thing we need to remember is that if you if you if you can't go to a hotel or you can't go on an airplane uh, or those kinds of things, well, those things are still in the CPI, and so uh, what may happen during this phase is that only parts of the CPI will be relevant to people, and other parts will be will be less relevant for a while. So a very difficult thing to, to, to frame up as a forecast. So I hope that gives you though something to work with. Thank you. I'm going to go to Greg Quinn next, but following Greg, just to queue up, uh, Kim McCrail, Jordan Press, Kevin Carmichael. Greg, please go ahead. Good morning. Uh, was the Bank of Canada asked by any government to create a provincial debt backstop because certain regions like Newfoundland were, were at risk of becoming insolvent? And, and more generally, how do you weigh such choices about buying government securities against central bank independence? Okay, so the, the short answer to that question is, uh, is no, and, and uh, very clear no. Uh, I can certainly say that in my experience that uh, the government of Canada has been unwavering in its uh, commitment to the principle of central bank independence. Um, so no one has asked us to do anything on the provincial front. Um, what, what we are looking at, though, as we said in, our, in, in the press release and in my opening remarks, is a provincial bond market that is still showing uh, significant signs of strain. Uh, that is a market not functioning well. So. Uh, that, of course, is true to some degree in almost every financial market these days. 
Uh, we have uh, made some improvements with the initiatives we've already taken. Uh, but uh, given that uh, even if in the Government of Canada market, we, we, we think that markets have, have been quite orderly, not perfect, but, but quite orderly. But we know, of course, that over the next uh, weeks and months, uh, there'll be extra demands put on those markets by the, the cash management needs of governments, both uh, federal and provincial. And so uh, we're alert to those uh, potential uh, market pressures. And so when people are demanding more liquidity than normal, it's our job to provide more liquidity than normal. And one way to target that is to put it in the specific markets that show the, more, the most strain, uh, as opposed to just spreading it in the, in the, uh, the short term, as uh, Carolyn was saying before. And so uh, we're taking that initiative uh, at this stage in order to uh, uh, make sure that those markets continue to perform and that governments are able to tap them for the, for the needs that they will have uh, to get us across, uh, across this difficult period. Thanks. Next question to Kim McCrail. Go ahead, Kim, please. Hi, thanks. Um, my, my question relates to household debt. What information will the Bank of Canada be looking at over the coming months to understand how highly indebted consumers are managing their debt? And what do you think will be the implications of additional stress on those highly indebted individuals in terms of broader financial stability and housing markets? So we've been uh, monitoring household debt for quite a while, as you know, and, and uh, we tend to uh, look far past the, the aggregate measures of uh, household debt to the disposable income to look at who's actually holding that debt and how indebted are they relative to their income? What are their debt service payments like? Uh, do they have any assets that, uh, that support that balance sheet or not? And so we will continue to do that. Uh, I would just note that we have a uh, we have a financial system review, which we will publish uh, in the in the coming months. Uh, it's in May, and so uh, you will see our full anal analysis of household debt there. You would know from our previous uh, s tests or stress tests of of uh, household uh, indebtedness and health that that. Uh, no, falling house prices is not great for your balance sheet if you're a household owner and you have a mortgage. Uh, but more important to you is really whether or not you have any income and, and uh, whether you have a job. And so that's why it's just so important that right now that, that uh, you know, we highlight the fiscal actions that have been taken uh, to provide that bridge the supporting actions the Bank of Canada has taken to, to uh, lower interest rates, to keep markets open so that credit markets continue to function, because it's really that bridge that when we get to the other side, will pave the way to a sustained recovery and then, and then uh, support the sustainability of the debt that's out there. Thank you. Next question to Jordan Press. Jordan, please go ahead. Oh, hi. Good morning. Um, Governor Pauls, I wanted to ask you, just given all the, if I could put it ugly, the grim economic news that is out there, the, the, the tone of the outlook, I'm curious if you can point to any good news that you think that the average Canadian, the average business owner uh, should look at in everything that you have put out as they look for a way forward out of all of this. Well, um, it is, it's an excellent question. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I may be at heart an optimistic person, but I, so I want to color, I want to make sure you understand that I've, this is not necessarily as objective as uh, I should be. Uh, but the fact, the fact is that um, we are doing a good job. Um, I'm, I'm impressed with how uh, people are, uh, you know, Observing the uh, the guidelines and the rules around uh, around uh, uh, you know uh, social distancing, etc., and uh, just just take a trip to the grocery store once a week at most, and there you are. You can see everybody practicing it really carefully. So um, so I, and I so I, I'm I'm reasonably optimistic that uh, that the, the the positive scenario that we have here, what I call the best case scenario. Uh, is still achievable. 
uh, we, it's, it's the, the negative one is there because, of course, we have to at least imagine or think through uh, what things would look like if, if we don't succeed with social distancing and don't succeed in getting the economy at least sequentially coming back online uh, relatively soon. Um, but anyway, I, I think uh, the, uh, the, the best case scenario that we've laid out here uh, uh, is achievable. We've, uh, the government has successfully uh, mounted, for example, the CERB was uh, a brand new uh, program, uh, so very similar to EI, but of course covering some, something like six million workers who were not covered by EI and therefore would not have a safety net in a major macroeconomic shock. That's a major accomplishment uh, in a very short space of time. And the, uh, and, and the, the wage subsidy plan, uh, which is even better because what it does is it maintains the connection between uh, the employer and the employee, meaning that when the economy can start up again, it can be immediate because you're actually right there, ready to work. Um, the suppliers, same thing. And so uh, that will, I think, uh, give us a very uh, quick leg up on the supply side of the economy. And of course, at the same time, puts a floor under consumer confidence. They should be feeling more confident given that their, their immediate needs are being covered by these, these tools. And now what we're making sure is that what they have to look forward to um, is uh, the lowest interest rates uh, that we've seen in a very, very long time. Uh, so if their uh, if their plans involve borrowing, in order to achieve those plans, whether it's to buy a new vehicle or or make a renovation to their home or buy a house, that those interest rates will be very low, and um, and uh, we we therefore have a lot of pieces in place for that recovery to be robust. So I think they should be positive about the outlook. Okay, Kevin Carmichael, I'm going to you next, followed by Gloria Galloway and Greg Bunnell. Kevin, please go ahead. Good morning, Kevin Carmichael from Financial Post. Um, this is an echo of Greg's question. Uh, you've entered or you're about to enter some trickier terrain by getting into the provincial bond market, the corporate bond market. To what extent um, is moral hazard a consideration in your decision to 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 set up these programs and going forward? Just how are you taking that into account? Sure. Uh, well, Kevin, you know central banks are always thinking about moral hazard. Uh, the primary concern today is about market functioning. And if you look at how the programs, the corporate bond, the provincial bond, look at the other purchase programs are designed, they really are, when you look at the amounts uh, that we've committed to relative to the size of the eligible universe, uh, the concentration limits, the minimum credit ratings, all those sorts of things uh, really point to the care that we've taken to uh, manage the, the risks of those programs in that regard and in, and in other regards. Uh, I think for, for institutions and governments right now that are trying to finance at a time when everybody's moving or a lot are moving to a flight to quality and financing needs are actually, funding needs are actually increasing, it really makes sense, it's the central bank's job to, to do what they can to help those markets function well. We've been doing that for years, since 1935. Uh, the assets that we're purchasing may be slightly different or shades of the past, uh, but everything that we're doing is consistent with our mandate to achieve uh, a sustainable recovery, pave the way for that, and, uh, and ultimately our inflation target. Thank you. Next up, Gloria Galloway. Go ahead. Uh, good morning, Governor and Deputy Governor. Um, the Bank of Canada unveiled corporate and provincial bond purchase programs. Was there any discussion or consideration of a program to purchase mortgage-backed securities? And is that something you might consider in the future? Um, so we, we currently are pur purchasing, have a program to purchase uh, Canadian mortgage bonds. After that, I'm not going to speculate about what we may or may not do in the future. But you can find the details of that particular program on our website. Okay, thanks. And the last question goes to Greg Bunnell from BNN. Go ahead, please, Greg. 
Uh, yeah, Governor, I just wanted to ask you, I imagine you read the papers, maybe even take a look at our website at Peter Bloomberg every once in a while. Uh, speculation as to whether you'll stay on. You said off the top this was your last NPR, clearly you're leaving in June. 60% uh, of the respondents to our question, but should you stay on at a time of crisis, said yes. Is it even being considered? I know you have a strong team, but at a time of crisis, does that make sense? Stay on, maybe to the fall? Well, I'm going to going to go back to the process. The process began uh, last December uh, to with our board leading this process to choose replacement. This is a very long a long plan. Uh, it's a seven year mandate. The seven year mandate ends on on June the second, and um, and as I've emphasized before, and you just mentioned, yes, we have a good team. You you a great team. And you see just uh, the tip of the iceberg of that team. Uh, there's uh, there's great depth around that team. I just happened to be the guy who was lucky enough to get the C on my jersey. Uh, that's um, I, I've said before that each of each of us brings a different uh, skill set to that table. Um, mine in, from the past has been helpful in this in this situation. But so as Ms. Wilkins or, or, or Tim Lane or Larry Shembry or Paul Baudry um, and, uh, or, or, or Tony Gravel, everybody's got a different background. It's that diversity that we aim for and we've achieved. And behind them is another circle of people uh, in the advisor level and managing director level with you know, 15, 20 or 25 years of experience in the bank. So the bank functions as an organism or an ecosystem, or I don't know what's the best term. Um, so please be assured that uh, you know it hasn't it hasn't been me that's been calling all these shots. Uh, it's it's a team effort. It really is, and uh, I I you know I think we can go ahead and continue this process, which as I said is uh, well I I guess it must be something like ninety percent complete. Okay, we are sorry that time is not gonna permit a second round of questions. Um, thank you to the governor and the senior deputy governor and for all of you. And uh, that concludes today's press conference. Merci tout le monde.